I think it would probably be 100 or more years before anything was put to direct value. I then came to New York and went to the dark side <laughs> of finance. Uh, and was there through circa 2005. I was a consultant, so I actually wasn't that much more directly connected to creating value uh, than I had been as a math uh, student. But guess you know, which one I made more money at. <laughs> um, I then went to ad tech as a CTO, a little bit more direct in the value, but you're still trying to optimize people to click on ads, and then who knows what else happens afterwards. Um, and still fairly capitalistic, I am now the chief data scientist at a marketing technology company, now in 2015, um, even much more closely directly connected to value and I think splitting the difference. Sail through, we've got about 400 plus e-commerce and media companies where our software is a service platform. Uh, companies like Mashable and The Economist or Birchbox and Alex and Ani and Frank and Oak. We take in email, social, website, mobile, and offline data through APIs. We also send communications and personalized experiences on those channels. And those personalized experiences cause the users or consumers of those brands to be more engaged and it generates greater revenue for our clients. So that's the fundamental business model. And when I joined SailThrough, I came to add more intelligence into the platform um, beyond just some of the recommendations that we do today. So the first big product that we've created since I've joined is something called Sightlines. Uh, and you can see on the left is an, uh, a screenshot of an individual user's profile and how Sightlines is rendered. It's a bunch of different predictions about this user's future behavior. What's their chance they're going to make a purchase? If they make a purchase, how much will it be for? How much revenue will they spend in total? What's the chance they're going to opt out of communications or engage in different channels or generate page views? And through the platform, what our clients can do is use it for analytics. They can do segmentation. They can do forecasting. They can use it for personalization. They can make recommendations that are sensitive to the price a user is likely to transact at. Or they can personalize discounts so they'll be relevant to a user at the amount they'll check out at. And then they can also use it for optimization to control the frequency of communication and also the channels for communication. So that's it for background. Now, I want to start with the requirements because just talking about the implementation without understanding some of the technical requirements, you don't fully understand why we made some of these, some of these decisions. So on average, we have around, say, 5 million users per client. The data is formatted in JSON coming out of our MongoDB production uh, infrastructure. And we're assuming the data is siloed across the clients. We want to predict a lot of different varying outcomes. Some of these things are normal. Some of them are Poisson. Some are binomial. Some should be quantile regressions, perhaps. We want to update the models and the predictions every day. The reason for that is we've got a thousand different clients. They can do lots of different things. Their business models can change. Competitors can come into the market. They can upload a bunch of historical data. We want to be able to continually pick up any and all of those trends. And then users are continually interacting with them and generating new data. So you need new predictions. We really only care about the predictive performance. And the real challenge here is we've got a thousand different clients. So we have to scale whatever we do to that volume of model building and prediction. So here's some of the math behind the strategy. We start out with first, let's get really cheap computing power. You know, 10 times cheaper than you might be able to get it in other places. Second, let's make sure we make those computers work really, really hard. Say three times harder than you might be able to make them in normal circumstances. Then I'm going to optimize the applications we build for ease of evolution. I want to make it really easy for us to make changes, and I want to make the code really easy to work with. So if I think about the uh, computations that we do, you know, half of them are GVMs being computed in memory and you know, highly optimized C++ code. I'm not going to optimize that significantly. But the other half is uh, getting the JSON data into features. And that's where a lot of the complexity in the system lies. And we make that somewhat inefficient. It could probably be five times more efficient. And so we lose some efficiency there with a 0.6 multiplier. And then the fourth step, we set up literally identical AB environments. Everything soup to nuts, completely identical. So we essentially double our spend in order to have completely identical environments. And I'll explain why we do that at the end. So even if you multiply all of those things together, you still get to a nine-fold efficiency improvement. And then we can really iterate the product aggressively. We can add new features. We can make it even more efficient. We can make it scale better. So let's start. How do you get cost-effective resources in the AWS cloud? How do you get uh, the unicorn and rainbow happiness uh, on the cloud? 
Well, let's take a really large instance in AWS, the R3.8x large. It's got 32 virtual CPUs. It's got 244 gigs of RAM. So first, let's look at the price dimension. So at the very top, if you pay on demand, where you're basically saying, I want this instance for an hour, you're going to spend $2.80 just for that instance hour. Alternatively, you can commit to a one-year contract or a three-year contract and get that price down to $1.76 or $1.05. But that's going to defeat any of your attempts to scale elastically. And you've got to commit to that resource for a very long term. Or you can use something called a spot instance. And I'll explain what those are, but you can get a spot instance on average for a tenth of the cost. So for just 28 cents for an hour. Then the other axis that really matters here is how efficient are you in utilizing the resources? A typical data center might only get 10% efficiency. Machines are sitting idle, CPU cores are sitting idle. In the cloud, maybe you can get that up to 30%. What we wanted to be able to do in a traditional implementation is get it all the way up to 90%. And so if you think about a data center and you did the math of operating at a 10% utilization and at a cost that's going to be equivalent to the, the three-year reserved cost. You know, if Amazon could drive that any lower, they, they would. They, they really can't. That's how much it, it costs to run an instance like that. Uh, you're going to be paying $10.50 for the compute hour you use in the data center. If you look at the cloud and maybe you get to 30% efficiency, but you're paying 280 instead, you're going to get to 980. We really wanted to get this down with spot instances, with something called Mesos and something that we've open source called Relay to 30 cents, the 28 cent spot CPM, uh, I'm sorry, spot uh, cost per hour, and the 90% efficiency. That's the 30 times more cost efficient. So how do the spot instances work? Basically, you have on the vertical axis, this is a, a chart directly out of uh, the Amazon price history, you've got how much you could spend for one of these instances. And say you start out and you bid $2 for a spot instance. The yellow line is what you actually pay. And so most of the time, you can see that yellow line is sitting down at 28 cents, but every once in a while, it spikes over $2. And when that happens, all your instances die immediately. You know, no notification. They're just gone. Uh, so that's actually a significant problem because you probably wanted some of those computations. And besides that, you definitely wanted to know that they didn't finish, and you're going to need to be able to ensure that they finish later. But these... Uh, spikes can happen frequently. Anytime somebody comes into the spot market and says, I have a whole bunch of computation and I want to buy all of the instances, or Netflix launches the, the house of cards, right? And all of a sudden the spot prices uh, go through the roof because they need more, more instances than they can get. Uh, you're going to have these things happen. So one tool that we use is something called Mesos, and it's self-described as a data center operating system. Uh, this is a screenshot of the Mesos master control panel, and it shows that at this point in time, we had 81 slaves. Uh, they're split across four different availability zones in two different instance types. All of those machines in AWS, spot instances, are aggregated together by Mesos into a single fungible pool of offers of CPU, RAM, disk, that applications can consume. So those 81 slaves account for 1,300 CPUs and 10 terabytes of RAM. And at that moment, we were 94% utilized uh, on the CPU. If you do the math for this, to pay for that 10 terabyte RAM, 1,300 CPU cluster costs about $12 an hour, uh, which is just uh, over $100,000 a year. So super cheap compute resources. So how does Mesos work? Uh, we combine it with something called Marathon. You start on the left-hand side, think about each of those grids as being a single instance in AWS, one of these so-called slaves. Uh, they might have 16 CPUs, they might have eight CPUs or 32 CPUs, and they're split across availability zones. Oftentimes we see prices, they spike at a specific instance type and in a specific availability zone. So by distributing the resources across those zones, uh, we'll be more resilient to price shocks. Mesos aggregates all of those together, and then there's a Mesos master node that's running. There will actually be three of them, and Zookeeper will ensure that one's always the master and running, doing the coordination. And it can work with an application called Marathon to take your different applications that are 
drawing down tasks from queues, and go out and schedule them on Mesos to ensure that they run. And some of the things that your applications have to be in order to really take advantage of this, first is distributed, because Mesos is going to put them wherever it wants. So your application needs to show up there, ready to run, no matter where it is. It also needs to be fine-grained. Uh, one of the things we learned early on is if you write applications that are relatively coarse in the amount of computational resources they use, say they're going to use 20 CPUs, and those 20 CPUs have to all be in the same place, then you're going to have a bin packing problem. So it really makes sense to have your applications as fine-grained as possible. And then they need to be idempotent. You need to make sure that if they run two times because the network is partitioned and one of them finishes and you don't realize it, that that's OK. They can continue to run two times. And you need to make sure that you can uh, also run them if they fail. So we set this up uh, and started to distribute all of the applications on it. And this is what we found in our Labrato monitoring for how we were utilizing the cluster. So first. On the vertical axis here is uh, Mesto CPU jiffies that are available, which I, I love that word. I guess it's like uh, the amount of computational work you could do in a jiffy. Um, and so you can really just think about it as the amount of work we have available via CPUs. And you can see sometimes uh, that drops in these sort of black sharp uh, drops. That's because the spot instance prices uh, escalated you know, quickly. We lost a whole bunch of instances and had to go out and buy them in one of the other availability zones. But then you can also see how much of the time is spent idle in brown versus actually being used by applications in yellow. So we had fine-grained applications that were running through Marathon, and yet we were still having a really hard time getting to that 90% utilization. And it turns out the problem is, is that this doesn't work very well for apps with highly variable load because some of these apps are going to have empty queue sizes. They're not going to have any work to do. Um, so what we needed was some way to be able to allocate resources in Mesos intelligently to the apps based upon the sizes of their queues. So one of the tools that we have developed and have open source is something called Relay.Mesos. It sits between the apps and Marathon and ensures that the apps are getting resources whenever their queue sizes are large. So it's essentially a thermostat for a distributed system, and it applies additional heat or com computational power uh, to any of the apps that have uh, significant queues behind them. After we implemented Relay, you can see the utilization went up to 80, 90 percent on average. Uh, so a, a huge improvement in being able to really work these resources hard. OK, so let's talk about the so-called efficient-ish application design. This is the pipeline. It's relatively simplified. Uh, but we start at the upper left with Mongo. We use ETL uh, in Python to get it out into uh, JSON and S3. So this is all of the different user profiles that we have sitting in S3. We'll go through the top path to be uh, assembling the data, building gradient boosting machines, storing those models as artifacts out in S3, and then analyzing those models and generating reports. And then the bottom path, once models are built, read the data again from S3 and do predictions, and then upload them through the sail through internal API so that they get back into Mongo and are available to our clients to use. So at a really high level, that's what the application path looks like. But it's actually much more complex. We've got 1,000 clients that need to run these sequences every day. And for each of those clients, we're building 10 different models, some of which may be products of multiple models. We've also got about 10 steps, many of which aren't shown here. And we need to take those steps and make them more fine-grained into, say, 100 subtasks. So what you end up with is a very, very complex directed graph of work that needs to be accomplished in this distributed system. We looked at things like Kronos uh, from Airbnb or Luigi from Spotify. And both had limitations that really couldn't do what we wanted to do, to be able to say, I want a template of work. I want to parameterize that template and ensure that it happens in a distributed system and control that through queues. So we created something called Stolos in Python to be able to do that. And that's how we handle the coordination and scheduling of all of the work behind this system. So the next step is to implement a sampling strategy. Uh, we don't often need all of the data we have. Uh, and so when we read the data from Mongo out uh, into S3, we use Spark to take it and uh, distribute it into a thousand different shards. We do that distribution on a hash of the user so that it's consistent over time. So as we get out to, say, day n, you can go across the shard number one 
and get a consistent 0.1% of data for this client and map that to a single MESO CPU that's going to do work on that JSON, say assembling it for, for, for model building or doing predictions on that 0.1%. Applications that need more data can just work their way up sample as they need it, right? They can slowly progress up to get more and more data until they have sufficient amount to, to build whatever model or do whatever data assembly that app needs. So this is a really quick and dirty way of being able to efficiently sample once and have it be consistent over time and then leverage that to reduce the computations you have to make by a hundred or a thousand times. One of the biggest challenges was the JSON data itself. This is a visualization of what an individual user's profile looks like for one of our clients. So the green dot in the very center is the, you know, the, the, the top of the JSON object. And then as you go out to all of the leaves, each of those leaves is a bit of data about this user. It could have been uh, a tag about an item that they purchased. It could have been an interaction that they had uh, with a mobile application through our SDK. It could have been their geographic location or it could be data that they're pushing to us directly through the API. We know nothing about. It's coming to us as JSON through the API and it's sitting there on the user profiles. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of machine learning algorithms out there that can operate on JSON data directly. I think that would be a really interesting challenge. So if anyone wants to take that up, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Instead, you've got to figure out how to take, you know, in this case, many millions of these JSON documents and extract features from them, right? Turn them into a matrix that has user on one side and feature on the other. And so how do you do that easily and efficiently? So as another problem, we created an open source library called tidyjson. It turns JSON into data frames. Um, it works inside of R. You can take arbitrary JSON. Um, and there's a couple of important things. One, it, it works seamlessly with dplyr in the Magritte pipe operator. So you can create these pipelines of data transformations in R that are really elegant and simple and quick. It also guarantees a deterministic structure. What you don't want to have happen is some of these profiles you know, are completely missing a great deal of data. You don't want them to come out the other side with a different set of structured features than profiles that are very rich. So you have to ensure that you're guaranteeing that deterministic structure so you can count on the feature matrix being something that will be interpretable. Then the last piece is to build the models themselves. So we chose GBMs. Uh, lots of different algorithms could work. Uh, a few reasons why we decided on GBMs. One, easy to predict varying outcomes with GBMs. Second, they're flexible enough. They can capture significant nonlinearities in some of the rich data that we have and complex interactions. We don't have to go in and do a lot of feature engineering specific to each and every client. Right, a big point of this system was there's a thousand clients, I've got a very small team, we can't go in and feature engineer each client's data by hand. There's some hyperparameters, but it's a minimal number, it's a controllable number. You have the depth of the trees, the shrinkage, and how many trees you ultimately choose. They're also robust to missing data, uh, very easy to handle missing data with these models, so that's another nice feature. So then we have the question of, okay, you've got to do a GBM. Uh, how do you distribute that? And just to remind you what a gradient boosting machine is with decision trees, you first start out, you build a very simple learner, the first tree. Uh, you weight that learner with uh, parameter alpha based upon your confidence in how well it performed. And then successively add additional trees to correct the errors of all of the prior trees. So you can continue to add these trees up to say tree K, it could be in the thousands or even tens of thousands of decision trees. Um, each of which has been weighted uh, to, to its accuracy and is trying to correct the cumulative errors of the prior trees. So the naive way to think about trying to distribute this is across the sum. Uh, why don't we just get Mesos to put each of these tree builds in a separate CPU? And that would be wonderful, except you really get bagging, uh, not boosting, right? Uh, because the fact of uh, the gradient boosting is it's iterative. You have to know the first n trees in order to build tree n plus one. So that approach doesn't work. It would work with something like random forests. The second is to distribute the computations behind each tree. And so there are libraries for doing trees in a distributed way. You can do this in Spark, you can do it in H2O. 
The challenge with it is it's a lot of overhead and coordination. You've got to distribute each tree and then get it back and then distribute the next trees and get it back, right? Because it's still iterative at the master. And if you've got skewness in those computations, you're going to run into trouble where resources are sitting idle because you're waiting for that nth node to come back with the result. Well, it turns out we've got to do 50,000 GBMs. We've got 1,000 clients and 10 models, and you've got to do cross-validation cross in order to tune some of the parameters. Um, so we literally just send each of these trees to an individual CPU and let it run for as long as it needs to. If it fails, we'll restart it. There's a chance that it might successively fail because we keep losing the spot instances, and that's okay. We'll use yesterday's tree. So it's not the end of the world. So that's the distribution of the GBMs. One important piece is you still have to do the grid search. You've got to figure out the size of the trees, so what's the depth? You've got to figure out the shrinkage, right, in order to control the complexity of the trees and cross-validate for the optimal number of trees. So we actually do that grid search periodically for every client to retune the models. Um, and this is a visualization of what the outcomes are for the grid search across shrinkage for different models, and the distribution is across clients. So you can see there's a radical variation. You know, different clients will have uh, different shrinkages by several orders of magnitude, uh, and the models behave very differently as well. Okay, so last is the easy maintenance and evolution. Uh, how many of you feel like your data science infrastructure looks like this? We, we didn't want that. We wanted something that was uh, more robust and something that we could evolve quickly. So first, we had to use a lot of different tools to accomplish this. You've got the different cluster tools. Asgard is the Netflix auto-scaling tool that we use to ensure that we always have the number of instances we want. You've got to maintain state. You've got to uh, be able to analyze the system. You've got to do log management. You've got to monitor and do alerting. We've got the applications. We're using different frameworks. We've got to do configuration. Everything has to come back up automatically. So you have to use Chef to do the configuration and console to have you know, some discovery. A lot of different tools. And it's hard to make changes when you've got these many tools interacting in a complex system and feel like you've got any confidence you know what's going to happen. So here's the process we use. We literally just double everything. Literally, from soup to nuts. The, I think the only thing we're, we're using is root 53 is the same in the two environments. And environment A will be getting the JSON data, so will environment B every day and running all the computations. But environment A is pointed to the API at this point, pushing predictions up into Mongo. On the other side, we've got Docker running on a laptop, and you can test all of these different applications you know, on your laptop in Docker. Uh, code committed up to GitHub and continuous integration happening in Travis. So we can feel confident that we've done something reasonable in the development cycle. We release something. It could be changes to the tools or the configuration or the application itself. And we release it to both environments and assume things are stable at this point. We come up with another release. We send it to B and everything goes up into flames. And we are fine with that because B is not connected to the API. Uh, so we just shut that release down and uh, do another release, v1.02. And whatever caused uh, uh, environment B to go up into flames, oftentimes it's logging related, it seems, uh, or sometimes zookeeper related. Um, things are now stable and we're OK. We'll then go through and compare the monitoring across the two infrastructure stacks. Are we being more efficient? We'll compare the logging. Are we generating more or less errors or errors of a different type? And then finally, we'll look at the out-of-sample or out-of-time tests to find out, did the model become more accurate or not in environment B? And once we've looked at all of those things, we'll accept that release, switch production to B, and start pumping results through the sale through user API, and then bring A up to version 1.02, and then wash and, and, and uh, start over again. So we can do this weekly. Um, without any real pain. Uh, and it's an easy, fun way to be able to continually evolve the system. So that's it. This is our team. Um, we've got uh, four folks working uh, closely on this application stack. Many of them are here. Thank you for the time.